Hi, today I'd like to say a few words about linear algebra in tensor terms. It's a very important topic. It's, uh, I've been meaning to do it for a while, so I'm very happy that I finally have the opportunity to do it. Before you watch this lecture, you need to watch my, linear, my short linear algebra lecture titled Matrix Representation of a Linear Transformation. And there, we considered the linear transformation of reflection. And we found, calculated the matrices that represent that transformation in two different bases. This was the first basis, and this was the second basis. And of course, we got two different matrices. So one of the three questions today is how are these matrices related? How can we go from one matrix to another? Of course, that's very similar to what tensor calculus is all about, studying how objects change when what they depend on, in this case, the basis, changes. So that will be question number one. Question number two, answered just as easily, is the matrix that represents the inner product. How does that change under a change of basis? And finally, we'll address the conundrum that this matrix is not symmetric. The reflection is a self-adjoint transformation. And very often the word symmetric is used for self-adjoint transformations. For example, people say the Laplacian is a symmetric operator, meaning that its representation with respect to a basis is by a symmetric matrix. And here you go. The matrix is not symmetric. Uh, so what answer? So how do you explain that? So just to set the tone right, I will actually not give any proofs. I will not give any explanations really for why things transform in the way that they do. What I will really show you that tensor, the tensor calculus notation itself tells you what the right transformations are. It doesn't necessarily explain why these transformations work, although it's easy to see, or using tensor notation, it's very easy to then argue that these are indeed the right transformations. But it's even easier to remember what the transformations are. Because you will recall from linear algebra that this, these two matrices are related by two matrix multiplications x and x inverse, where x is the matrix that relates the quote-unquote new basis to the quote-unquote old basis. Notice there are primes on the numbers here, no primes here. This is the old basis, this is the new basis. So this may be called the matrix x. And it's x on one side, x inverse on the other, or if you don't remember exactly, maybe it's x on one side, x transpose on the other, or maybe x transpose, x transpose inverse. It's just impossible to remember. And of course, I don't remember it either, but the tensor notation always tells me what the right way is. And if we call this the matrix X, sometimes it's this matrix that's called the matrix X, sometimes it's transpose that's called the matrix X. So that just adds to the confusion. So we're going to clarify all of it. So tensor notation comes in very handy. So in tensor calculus, we start with coordinates, and that gives rise to the covariant basis. In linear algebra, it's opposite. It all starts with the basis. And then maybe components of vectors can be considered affine coordinates. So now we have a basis. And of course, in tensor calculus, we would write it E sub i. And in linear algebra, we would write a vector v. If its components are v1, v2, v3, we would maybe, with a summation sign, write vi, ei, both i's on the bottom. But of course, in linear algebra, we would write vi, ei, excuse me, with tensor notation, we would write vi, ei. So vi are transformations, excuse me, are the components of this vector with respect to this basis. And of Chile, the placement of this index, this making it a contravariant type object will also tell you how the components of a vector change from one basis to another. Now let's think about how we would write these matrices in, with indices in indicial notation. Of course, they're second order systems, so we'll need two indices. But where A, I, J, but where do you put them? Do you put them on top or do you put them on the bottom? You will see in just a moment that there is really no choice. And the indices really place themselves and they're being placed themselves actually tells you immediately how the objects change. And you will show you, it'll show you immediately how to get this matrix from this matrix. 
Well, let's see. In linear algebra, we would write V equals AU. I'm not entirely sure if these are the letters I used in that lecture. But in, in sensor calculus, we would write VI equals A. Now, AIJ, we'll place the indices in just a moment. UJ. So where do the indices go? Well, of course, I would go on top and J would go on the bottom. So a matrix representing the linear transformation, here they are. I counts as the first index, J counts as the second. We've got to adopt the convention. That's the convention we adopt. So here is AIJ, here is AI prime J prime. So linear, excuse me, tensor calculus. Rather, the tensor calculus notation tells you, even though we're yet to prove it, we might still owe it to ourselves to prove this, but forget about it, because it's abundantly clear how AIJ and AI prime J prime are related. Of course, they're related by the fact that AIJ is a contravariant covariant tensor. So I will write right away that A I prime J prime, which is this matrix, equals A I J J I prime I J J J prime. So we have the answer in tensor terms. We just have to translate it back into, mat into matrices, into the language of matrices. The question came up in the question of matrices, in the language of matrices, we have to answer it, <coughs> excuse me, in the language of matrices. Now what are, what are these J's, the Jacobians? Well, the Jacobians, of course, somehow relate the vector, the, the vector Z. So, of course, we know because this is the covariant type object, just by the placement of the index, now, you, you should think about this arbitrariness, because of course it was completely arbitrary that we put the index on the bottom. We could have put it on top, right? But then everything would sort of readjust itself and that change would propagate the whole thing and the discussion would once again work. So I'm not claiming that this basis element, that this basis is covariant, but let's just call the way in which it changes covariant. Right? There is some arbitrariness there. Then the component would change in the opposite way, in the matrix inverse way, and we would call it contravariant. We could have taken the opposite choice. We could have called these with an upper index and called the way they transform the covariant way. Or maybe, we, well, you see what I'm saying. Maybe because of the place of the we would have called that contravariant way. Right? But then this index would be called I, with a, on the bottom, and we would call it the covariant component. And again, this change will propagate the entire discussion and everything will work. So you just, just accept that the arbitrariness is there. So we call it covariant. So in other words, we call the way by which it changes, co the covariant way. Some arbitrariness there. So, but we know that then EI prime equals J I I prime E Ah, all right. Let's actually find out what the values of this matrix is. And I, again, I want to alert you right away, so that's what we'll focus, zoom in on, because you have to be careful. Again, we're thinking of this index as first, this index as second. That's also convention, but it's a convention that propagates the whole discussion. That choice is arbitrary, which index we're calling first and which index we're calling second. But once we've made our choice, we have to stick with it. The index that we're calling first, when we write it in as a table of numbers, if we're not writing it as a table of numbers, it doesn't even matter. But because we will be writing down matrices, the first index tells you what row you're in, the second index tells you what column you're in. Had we made the opposite choice in terms of what we're calling first and what we're calling second, second, all of the matrices that we're writing down would have to be the transposes. So, you always have to pinpoint the moment when you're making an arbitrary choice, like choosing a normal, one way or the other, 
But then once you've made that choice, stick with it. So let's figure out what matrix this would be represented by. All right, so here's the word of caution. So because we're now calling this index first and this index second, you're seeing that the contraction happens on the first index. In the video, I will put an annotation that sends you back to a lecture where we talked about the matrix representation of contractions. And you will recall that for it to be straight J times E in the matrix sense, the contraction would have to be on the second index because it's A, I, J, B, J. Right? So, but because the contraction happens on the first index, there will be some kind of transpose involved. So you'll see in a moment where the transpose comes in. But let's figure out how the two bases are related in the matrix sense. So I wrote, I just put them artificially as elements in a column, just so that the matrix multiplication formalism can kick in. So now uh, I just have to think of how E1 prime, which is this vector, is a linear combination of E1 and E2, and these two numbers will go here. Because if you think matrix product, this first line would be this number times E1 plus this number times E2, and that should be E1 prime. And that's very simple because, of course, you notice that EY prime is E2. So just quick word, doesn't matter. The vectors in the lecture were length square root of 3, but square root of 2 won't change this at all. So I decided to make it simply here and call it square root of 2. So the two numbers here are 0 and 2. What about E2 prime as a linear combination of E1 and E2? Well, E2 prime, I think you need to go, one second, let me figure it out. You need to flip E2, that will land us here, and then plus E1, and then plus E1. And that would, so I, the way I'm seeing it, it's minus E2. <laughs> So this, of course, is a 1. I can imagine so many confused viewers. All right. So, and I forgot what I was saying here. So minus, so it's 2e1 minus e2. 2e1 minus e2. Okay. So... Now, if we talk about the matrix representation of this guy, let me call this the matrix X. Now, let me add right now an annotation to another lecture that's entitled Why It Works, that talks about why this sort of matrix multiplication in the component space actually does represent the linear transformation. And there, with very good reason, you will see that we represent, instead of taking column vectors, we took row vectors and we related a row of E's. You know, we worked with a row of E's. Had we done the same thing here, it's not this matrix that would have appeared there, but because it's this row equals this row times some matrix, it would actually be just the transpose of the whole thing. And we would, and we would see the transpose of this. And it's actually, now if you think about what matrix represents this Jacobian, it's the transpose of this. It is the transpose of X transpose that represents this as a matrix. Precisely because, precisely because what this relationship right here is meant to capture exactly this relationship, this matrix relationship right here. And because the contraction is on the first object, what the matrix that you see here is not the matrix that represents this object, it is its transpose. So if you want to find a matrix that represents J, I, I prime, it would be the transpose of this, which is 0, 1, 2, negative 1. All right, now we have a matrix that represents this object. And now we know exactly how this object is related to this one. Let me just rewrite it in the order. Let me just rewrite it in the order that would make it very clear where to put the matrices. I'll make the indices line up just right. So it continuing with that identity, 
Okay, so rewriting this in a nice order, I would write this as j i prime i a i j j j j prime. Here is why it's such a nice order because second index here is contracted with the first index here, and the second index here is contracted with the first index here. So it's uh, this matrix times this, whatever represents this matrix, times whatever represents this matrix, times whatever represents this matrix. And this is the one, if you look right here, that's the one we have right there. We have the A right here. And of course, what this is, as you know, is the inverse of this. So the claim is that this matrix, which is A I prime J prime, is the inverse of this times the matrix A times this. Let me erase the board, write down that identity, just so that you see that it's correct. Okay, here you have it. A prime, in other words, A I prime J prime, a right here in the middle, that's translating the original expression into a matrix form. On the right, we have the matrix that we've evaluated here. And of course, it's one of those X transpose, if you call this the matrix X. So in linear algebra notation, you have to be super careful if you're calling this X or X transpose, but in any case, it's this matrix. And on the left, I've calculated its inverse, and its inverse happens to be this. So there you go. So if I actually had to write this, something that you couldn't remember, uh, and, if, and if you wrote it down, it wouldn't help you, because then you wouldn't be quite sure what you're calling x. So I think any attempt to remember this uh, is futile. But the linear algebra notation, excuse me, the tensor calculus notation, the placement of the indices just easily reminds you just tells you it makes it easy to remember. You don't have to remember it. It reminds you what matrices to use. But in matrix notation, you would have to say X transpose and X inverse transpose. Uh, but you don't need to really worry about the linear algebra notation, uh, which is not bad here. It just doesn't help you remember. And the tensor calculus notation does. And you can multiply these matrices out, and you will see that you will indeed get this. So here is what we've succeeded at. I think the more important thing we've succeeded at so far is started thinking about the fundamental things in linear algebra in tensor notation. Of course, the matrix notation is far more important than linear algebra because that's what really makes linear algebra algebra and the fact that everything can be expressed as matrix multiplication. All of those ideas are very powerful. And of course, the matrix notation is number one. But the tensor notation also has its utility. And it's especially great in two situations. Number one, when you have to think about transformations and how things transform under a change of basis. That's what I meant by the word transformation. And then also if you need access to the individual entries of the matrix, which, is with, which we discussed in the context of quadratic form minimization. And we had a lecture on that, so I'll add a link to that lecture as well. All right, so let me erase most of the board, and we'll talk about the inner product in tensor notation. Thank you.